I bring you greetings from the Daughter Church, Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Mission Church in Cebu City. I praise and thank the Lord for this great opportunity and a privilege to be able to come with a few of our brethren to attend the church camp. It was indeed a blessed and a fruitful time for us, especially to most of our church members that has come being the first time. And it was an, somehow an educational trip also for them. As most of you know, we are also praying for our first combined church come, get willing, on the 30th of April up until May 2nd. Do continue to remember the work in Cebu and in Philippines as well in your prayers. And I praise and thank the Lord also for this opportunity given unto me to share with you God's word this afternoon. For a time of meditation, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, we shall be considering for our meditation verses 12 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Shall we read this passage responsively? I shall begin by reading verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who had enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should be hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless our meditation this afternoon. I titled my sermon, Doxology to the King. Doxology to the King. We have been singing the doxology all these years in our worship service. But have you ever thought about what is the meaning of doxology? For sure, whenever we ask the children, Oh, doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Yes, it's a doxology. But there are different doxology that we need to consider what is doxology. Doxology is essentially a hymn of thanksgiving, adoration and worship to God. It is an ascription of praise. We can read many doxologies in the Bible, usually to express gratitude and to give glory and honor to him. One example is found in Luke chapter 2 verse 14. Wherein the angels proclaim and ascribe glory to God in these words. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Another example can be found in the concluding portion of the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 13. Where it says, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Gloria Patri is also a form of doxology. The Old Testament also is rich in doxology. 
You can find lots of them in the book of Psalms. It can also be found in the writings. One example can be found in 1 Chronicles. I invite you to turn your Bibles for a while to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, looking at verses 10 to 13. And ponder upon this great doxology of David. Reading verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come to thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, O God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Indeed. What a great doxology of David. This is right after he and all the tribes of Israel have gathered and collected all the materials that they need to build the house of God. Just a while ago in our worship service, we sang the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right after the collection of our tithes and offerings, I believe it is because we sing it as a humble recognition and expression of our gratitude to God. And so we praise Him for His goodness, for His faithfulness, for all the things that He has done unto us. In today's text, we find a moving doxology by Paul, ascribing praise, honor, and glory to God for all the great and wonderful things He has done. I say moving because it comes as an outright, spontaneous outburst of Paul's thanksgiving unto God. While in the middle of writing this letter to Timothy, trying to encourage Timothy to press on in the service to the Lord, he was moved in his heart to ascribe this doxology unto God. Beginning at verse 12, Paul is recounting all the wonderful things he had experienced, those things that happened in his life, of which he was thankful and attributed all, God, all to God the glory. We read in verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who had enabled me, for he had counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. In here, the Apostle Paul thanked God, firstly, for his calling unto the ministry. This is Paul's way of encouraging Timothy, saying that it is of the Lord's working that he is in the ministry, and that it is also the Lord who counted him faithful and enabled him to accomplish great and mighty things for the Lord. It is just like Paul saying, it is not my own doing. It is all by God's. Notice these few words here. In verse 12, he said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who had enabled me. And then it went on, who counted me faithful and then putting me into the ministry. He even took time to narrate to Timothy his life prior to his conversion, whereby he acknowledged his nothingness before God. Read verse 13, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
looking at his old self, perhaps the Apostle Paul thought of becoming a minister is way, way beyond my imagination. As here in verse 13, he reminds himself of who he was before the Lord called him. And the thought of becoming a minister of the gospel is just far way beyond he could imagine. But lo and behold, it did happen. And he could not help but praise and thank the Lord Jesus Christ for his mercies unto him. That firstly enabled him, that first counted him faithful and putting him into a ministry or into the ministry. Looking at this experience of the Apostle Paul, I trust that this would give us a great encouragement because in here we have that assurance that God by His abundant grace and mercies will not hold our past life against us when we serve Him in the ministry. As he wrote in Romans chapter 8, There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. God has called us unto salvation, and it is He also that calls us unto Christian service. It is He that calls us unto the ministry. In most, if not all companies, whenever they would screen potential job applicants for hire, they would surely consider, firstly, the educational attainment of the applicants. Then, perhaps, the work experiences of the applicants. Then, perhaps, the skills and the attitude of the applicants. Over and above, for sure, they would examine if these applicants have passed derogatory records. That is what uh, companies and workplaces in Philippines does. Among the qualifications, at the end of it, must have no criminal records, must have no derogatory records. Thanks be unto God that it is not the case in Christian service and ministry. Realize that our wicked and sinful past is no bar for us to serve Him in the ministry. Neither it is a hindrance to serving Him if we truly repented from all our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Realize this wonderful truth before us. That no matter who you are, no matter what you are before you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not be a bar for you not to serve Him in the ministry. Ministers cannot make ministers, much less persons make themselves ministers, for it is the Lord's calling. And those whom He calls, He equips. And those He equips, He qualifies to the ministry. And so thus, no minister of the gospel could boast that it is His personal qualification his personal intelligence, his achievements that puts him into the ministry. No Christian worker can boast of all these things. No Christian worker could say that he is in the ministry because he is qualified. He is more or highly recommended that he has this moral uprightness in him, 
that he is better than others. But rather, all Christian workers, ministers of the gospel, ought to be like Paul, to thank God for calling us into the ministry. In verse 14, the Apostle Paul continued to mention of all the things that he had experienced. He said, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. In here he mentioned of God's abundant grace, exceeding abundant grace, which is in Christ Jesus, that brought about his salvation. In verse 13, we have seen his past life prior to his conversion. And in verse 14 here, he mentions that it is by the grace of God. It is by the grace of God. That God's exceeding abundant grace that outweighs Paul's previous sinful life. Paul himself, having experienced this exceeding abundant grace, Wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Think of how significant these words are to Paul when he wrote it. God's exceeding abundant grace. That since then. He has not failed to acknowledge the working of God's grace in his life. It is the same grace that called him into the ministry. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 7 we read, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. It is also the same grace that enabled him to accomplish great and mighty things in the gospel work. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. My dear brothers and sisters, as we consider this portion of Paul's letter to Timothy may it also move our heart to thank him for his grace and mercies upon us. In here, the more and greater the things that Paul has accomplished, the more he acknowledged the grace of God in his life. It would be easy for us serving the Lord in the ministry to boast. I did it my way. I did it my way. But not with Paul. He is mindful and ever conscious that in all things he was able to do it. He was to, able to accomplish great and mighty things for the Lord because of God's exceeding and abundant grace. No wonder the hymn writer John Newton would call it amazing grace. Right from the beginning up to the very end. It is all by the grace of God. How about us, my dear brothers and sisters? Can we see the working of God's grace in our life? Have you realized what would become of us without the grace of God? Let's continue to consider the words of Paul here. In verse 15, the Apostle Paul thanked God for his glorious gospel when he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Here is the actual demonstration of God's abundant grace. The sum of the whole gospel that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Indeed, it is good news worthy of all acceptation. 
It echoes the words of the Lord Jesus himself. When he said, I came not to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. It is interesting to note how Paul identified himself here as the chief of sinners. Meaning, first rank or top rank sinner. And yet, he enjoyed the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Conscious and aware of his former life, Paul here thanked God for his glorious gospel that is able to save him. You can just ponder and think of how glorious the gospel is. That to Paul, who identified himself as the chief of sinners, to receive grace, to be saved from all his sins, he can only say, this is a faithful saying. He is trying to make that emphasis unto Timothy. That this is a true saying and that you must believe. That's why he calls it the glorious gospel. The glorious gospel that could translate sinners from condemnation to justification to sanctification and eventually to glorification as we recently learned from pastor's message in the camp. And this is the same gospel that is available unto all today. That may we all be encouraged to continue to reach out and preach the gospel so that sinners would come to repentance and be saved. Not only Paul thanked God for his calling into the ministry, thanked God for his glorious gospel, he continued to thank God in verse 16 for the mercies obtained. Paul here said, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Note here that God is pleased to magnify his mercy in the conversion and salvation of sinners, even the chief of them. And so, in return, the greatest sinner also, the chief sinner, take comfort and in return give glory unto him who has saved him. Paul, the great blasphemer and persecutor, has obtained mercy for a pattern and example to all such sinners that would follow thereafter. That they too would forsake their evil and wicked ways and give up themselves sincerely to the obedience of the gospel. There is no greater testimony of the power of the gospel than that of a transformed life. The people who knew Paul prior to his conversion might have been doubtful at first, might have been suspicious at first, only to be convinced later that indeed it is true and genuine salvation that is brought about by the transforming power of the gospel. As Paul here said, that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for the pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I could not help but think of how many of us have obtained the mercies of God when we were deep in darkness and sin, showing a pattern, causing our immediate families and loved ones to follow 
and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In our mission church in Cebu, many of those in the congregation came to believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved because of a father, a husband, a son, or even a friend was once in bondage and in darkness of sin, whose life has long been transformed through the power of the gospel. And they, seeing themselves, the change that has happened and took place in the lives of their husbands, in the life of their father, in the lives of their friends, setting a pattern unto them, have been convinced in their heart that indeed it is by the power of the gospel that their dearly beloved have been changed and have been transformed. That in God's perfect time, they too had been brought to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is it so? Because God in His grace and mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ saved those words of sinners setting a pattern for others to follow. I want us to ponder upon our lives. Like Paul, we are saved by God's exceeding grace. And by His tender mercies, God called us unto His salvation, even called some unto the ministry. God brought about change in us. He has given us new life and given us hope and many more. I wonder if we truly appreciate all the things the Lord has done unto us. I wonder how many of us are really grateful to God, like Paul. Many people tend to believe that they are saved because they choose to believe in Jesus. Some tend to believe that they are deserving of God's salvation. Some believe that they are good enough to be saved. And that if God has saved them, He is just doing the right thing. Thus, they could not appreciate the wonders of God's grace and mercies. But as far as the scripture is concerned, it is all by the grace and mercies of God. That like Paul here when he said, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The very thought of God's exceeding grace and pardoning mercy towards him caused him to burst in praise and thanksgiving. That while in the midst of writing, he could not go on writing his letter without pausing for a moment to give praise and glory to God for everything he has done. Thus, as he continued to write, trying to look back of how the glorious gospel has called him to the ministry, of how the glorious gospel has saved him, of how the glorious gospel have enabled him, he paused for this instantaneous impromptu doxology in verse 17. That he can only say, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In here, Paul gives back unto God everything the glory, the honor, and the praise. Looking back at how the Lord has saved him, how the Lord has called him into the ministry, how the Lord has enabled him to do great and mighty things in the ministry, he never take credit of it all. But rather, he could no longer contain that thanksgiving and praise in his heart. He can only say, Now unto the King Eternal, in this short steering doxology, Paul uses several majestic descriptive terms of God. 
he firstly named him the king eternal acknowledging that God is sovereign in his life and that as a king he would be serving him all his life looking at this doxology here is a basic theology for us whereby Paul identified and attributed to God his eternal kingship. Meaning, he is the king of kings, the king of ages. That all of us, his people, must serve him, must be subject under him. And he must reign sovereign in our lives. He must rule in our hearts and that we must be subject to him. Not only in this life, but for eternity. He went on to say, King eternal and then immortal. This word implies more than just exemption from death. God being immortal is about his being incorruptible. Not able to be stained by either decay or death. What a comfort for us to realize. That our God is King eternal and He is immortal. He continued, The King eternal, immortal, and then invisible. Meaning God is a spirit, and as such, he cannot be seen. Then the only wise God, with all the thoughts of how the Lord has saved him, he could not continue with his writing unless he would give credit and glory unto God. That in here, he said, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. I could not read more into the letter of Paul. But the fact that he gives glory unto God in this short doxology in verse 17. It is good enough for us to know that Paul indeed was grateful. Paul indeed was thankful unto the Lord for all the things that God has done in his life. In here, it is like Paul saying, it is God and God alone who deserves honor and glory for all the things that happened in his life, for all the things he has accomplished. For all the things he has achieved. Brothers and sisters. We might as well look back at our own life. And see where you are before the Lord called you. From the day you believe and receive him as your Lord and personal Savior. Up to this very moment. Think about all the goodness of the Lord in your life. Think about the grace and mercies of God in your life. Think about all the things, the goodness, the love, His faithfulness. I pray that may it also move you like Paul to say, unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Let us pray.